The ASUS ZenBook Duo laptop has two screens, but is around half the price of the more expensive Pro Duo version that I've previously covered. In this review, you'll find out what features this cheaper version has to offer and find out if it's worthwhile. Starting with the specs, I've got a 10th gen quad core Intel i5 CPU, Nvidia MX250 graphics, 8GB of memory and dual channel, two screens which we'll look at in depth soon, and a 512GB M.2 NVMe SSD. For network connectivity, it's got the latest Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5. No Ethernet port though, so you'll need to use an adapter if you need it. It's available with a few different specs though, including i7 CPU, up to 16GB of memory or 1TB SSD. You can find examples and up-to-date pricing linked in the description. The ZenBook Duo is basically the baby version of the ZenBook Pro Duo that I've covered previously on the channel. The Pro model is larger and offers all the bells and whistles, while the Duo we're looking at here is meant to be more of a budget-friendly option. So it's lower spec and not quite as feature-rich as a result. On the spun metal lid we've got the ASUS logo on the celestial blue finish. The interior is the same colour, and we can see that second screen above the keyboard, which is pushed down the front as a result with the touchpad on the right. Overall the build quality was good, the all metal design was solid and there were no sharp corners or edges anywhere. ASUS lists the weight at 1.5 kilos or 3.3 pounds and mine was just a little above this. With the small 65 watt power brick and cables for charging, the total weight rises to just below 1.9 kilos. It's quite portable. As a 14 inch machine, the width and depth are noticeably smaller compared to the 15 inch laptops I typically deal with, and it's not too thick either. The height will change when you open the lid. When you open it up, the bottom of the screen props up the rear. This has the advantage of improving cooling, as more air can get in underneath. It also improves the viewing angle for the second screen, the keyboard is raised to be on a better angle for typing, and the speakers aren't pressed flat against the desk. With the basics out of the way, let's get into the most interesting part of this laptop, the dual screens. The bottom screen, what they're calling ScreenPad Plus, is a 12.6 inch touchscreen with a 1920 by 515 resolution with a 60Hz refresh rate. It's got a matte finish and 178 degree viewing angle. You can use either your finger or pen, however mine didn't come with a pen in the box despite there clearly being a spot for it, so I'm not sure if that's meant to be included. It's not listed as included in the box on the website though. The primary display is a 14 inch 1080p 60Hz panel, however there's no touchscreen functionality here, only on the lower screen. It's got 8mm screen bezels based on my own measurements, giving it a 90% screen to body ratio. I've used the Spider 5 on both screens. For the main 14 inch panel we're looking at 95% sRGB, 66% NTSC and 72% Adobe RGB. The 12.6 inch screen pad on the other hand wasn't quite as good. I measured it with 67% sRGB, 48% NTSC, and 50% Adobe RGB. I don't think it's a big deal if it's not as good. It's mostly meant to be used for showing extra things like tools or additional content, rather than being the primary display source, so it doesn't need to be as impressive as the main screen. The primary panel was also a bit brighter at full brightness, and also had a higher contrast ratio. Overall it did look better to me than the screen pad. As for backlight bleed, there was a little in the main panel, but I never noticed this during normal use. The screen pad was harder to get a photo of, but it also appeared to have a little bleed, however this will vary between laptops and panels. That's a lot of information on the screens, now let's get into how they actually work. Basically the screen pad, so the one on the bottom, acts as a second monitor. This means you can simply drag things between the two screens and windows, just like dual monitors on a desktop PC. The ZenBook Duo comes with the Screen Expert software installed, and this lets you manage the second screen. It's got some useful features. For example, if you start dragging a window on either screen, it offers a shortcut for you to quickly move it to the other screen. You can also use the View Max option on the end to make the window fully take up both screens, and you can drag an application to the pin icon which adds it to the app launcher. On the bottom screen it's easy to set two windows side by side with the standard windows method of dragging the windows over to the far sides. 
However, the software also lets you set three side by side. I didn't find a limit of apps I could have on the bottom screen, it's just a second monitor. But the software only lets you easily tile three side by side. On the second screen, there's this faint arrow icon on the left that you can press to bring up the screen pad options. And this displays the app launcher, allowing you to quickly open apps you've added here. And you can also change the order or remove icons. This is also where you adjust the brightness of the lower screen. I wasn't able to change it through Windows. If you go deeper into the settings, you can get more granular brightness control. The next option lets you configure up to four task groups. Basically, you set up the apps you like using on the screen pad how you like them, click the capture button and it will remember them. That way you can easily select the task group and it will automatically open up the same apps. If you have more than three apps when making the task group, it'll only show the first three tiled side by side, and you can only have up to four groups. Below that is a shortcut to quickly swap the windows open on each screen. So the windows up top move below, and the ones on the bottom screen move up to the top one. There's also a dedicated key on the keyboard to do this as well, just above the touchpad. The next option is the app navigator, which just lets you see the open apps on the screen pad so you can swap between them. The last icon locks the keyboard, preventing keys from being used. This could be useful for drawing on the screen pad without worrying about pressing keys with your hand. Otherwise, there's also the screen pad settings, which along with what you can do here, allows you to make that hovering arrow icon disappear until you need it and other options. If you don't want to use the second screen, you can quickly disable it by pressing the button next to the power button. This lets you turn it on or off. I could spend 10 minutes going through possible use cases for the second screen, but instead I'll refer you to the review of the Pro Duo linked in the description, as you can use it for the same things, which includes streaming, gaming, editing and more. It's literally just a second monitor, so you can use your imagination as to how it would benefit your workflow. There was only a little screen flex, the metal lid was fairly sturdy. I wasn't really able to film it, but the hinges are out towards the far corners which helps with stability. Despite feeling lightweight, I was still able to open it up with one finger, so weight is distributed fairly. It was a little awkward feeling using it on my lap due to the way the back raises it up, but it worked well enough. Although the screen has a thinner bezel, the 720p camera is still located up the top, and it's got IR for Windows Hello support. The camera looks pretty blurry, but the audio sounds pretty good. Although typing on the keyboard normally is pretty quiet, with the camera on, you can hear it quite a lot. I found the 5.5 degree angled keyboard fine to type with, so long as you've got adequate space on your desk to push it back a bit as it's right down the front. Unlike the more expensive Pro version, no wrist rest was included. The keys have 1.4mm of key travel, and here's how typing sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. Note how much quieter it is compared to what we heard through the camera. The keyboard has white backlighting which can be adjusted between three levels or turned off with the F7 key. And all keys and secondary key functions are illuminated. Despite being elevated off the desk, there was minimal keyboard flex when pushing down hard. The metal chassis was fairly sturdy, and I found the letter keys needed 56 grams of force to actuate. As a result of the keyboard being right down the front, the precision touchpad has been moved over to the right. It's smaller and narrow, so you'll probably want to use a mouse. However, after a bit of use, I did get used to it. The touchpad itself doesn't actually click down. It's instead got physical left and right click buttons, which weren't too loud to press. Unlike the Pro model, there's no option of turning this into a numpad. Fingerprints don't really show up on the keyboard and touchpad. After a lot of screen pad use, they were a bit more obvious, but it was easy to clean. They're easy enough to see on the metal lid, but as it's a smooth surface, they were easy enough to clean. Although it does slide around a bit like this, when you actually open it, it was a bit more stable due to the rubber feet on the back which come into contact with the desk when open. There's nothing on the front side. On the left from the back there's the power input, HDMI output, the version isn't specified, but I could only run a 4K monitor at 30Hz so it's not 2.0, USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type A port, and USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type C port. No Thunderbolt though. On the right from the front there are a couple of status LEDs, a micro SD card reader, 3.5mm audio combo jack, and a USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type A port. Underneath there's just some small air vents in the center, we'll check out thermals soon. The two speakers are found towards the front left and right corners. They sounded above average with a little bass, and perhaps better due to the extra space between them and the desk which is caused by raising the back up. They seemed fairly loud when playing music at maximum volume, and the latency mon results looked good. 
The bottom panel was easy to remove after taking out 10 TR5 screws. Inside we've got the battery down the front and single M.2 drive. That's pretty much it. The memory is soldered to the motherboard and can't be upgraded, so you have to buy it with what you need from the start. The ZenBook Duo is powered by a 4 cell 70 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the two screens on, and also just the main screen on and second screen underneath off. Both screens were at 50% brightness for this test and keyboard lighting was disabled. As expected, with both screens on, the battery drains faster. However, even with it on, the results are still well above most other laptops. Although the game test ran the longest, it's important to note that it only ran at 21 FPS rather than the usual 30 FPS from the Nvidia Battery Boost cap, as the battery didn't seem to be able to provide enough power to run it higher. It was still usable, until there was 5% left where it dipped to 5 FPS, where it lasted for a further 9 minutes than what I've shown on the graph. The small 65 watt power brick seemed adequate for these specs. I didn't have any battery drain during any of my testing. You can use the Myasu software to change the charge level limit though. I left mine set to 100%. Let's move on to the thermal testing. The cooling solution is just a couple of fans in the middle with three total heat pipes. Air is pulled in from underneath and then exhausted out below the screen. The Myasu software allows us to pick between the default auto mode for best performance or silent mode which runs quieter with slower fan speed. Thermal testing was completed with an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius. At idle, the temperatures were quite cool. The rest of the results are from combined CPU and GPU stress tests and are meant to represent a worst case where both are being loaded up. I've used A to 64 with the stress CPU only option checked and the Heaven GPU benchmark at the same time to fully load the system. Even worst case in silent mode, the CPU is reaching 75 degrees Celsius. There was no thermal throttling under sustained heavy load. These are the clock speeds for the same tests just shown. The GPU speed basically doubles by enabling auto mode. And we also see a boost to the CPU clock speed as the CPU TDP limit increases to 15 watts which is the default of the i5-102-10U CPU. Undervolting then helped improve things just a little more. The main limitation here was that 15 watt power limit. Here's how CPU only performance looks in Cinebench. Auto mode improved performance a little as the CPU power limit on average rose from 11 to 15 watts. However, we could get a fair boost to multi-core performance with a small undervolt. Granted, this seemed to negatively affect the single core result. As for the areas where you'll actually touch, at idle the keyboard area was quite cool. The screen pad looks warmer comparatively, but most laptops at idle are around the same 30 degrees Celsius, so not really an issue. With the stress tests running, the keyboard is a little warmer, but still on the cooler side. The screen pad was now warm, up to 40 degrees. This is expected given the heat generating components are directly underneath. And right up the back is in the mid 50s as air gets exhausted just below the screen. Here's what the fan noise sounded like while running these tests. At idle it was completely silent. With the stress tests running in silent mode, the fan was extremely quiet. I could only just hear it by putting my ear right next to it. Then in auto mode, it's still realistically fairly quiet compared to most other laptops I've tested. All things considered, there were no issues with the thermal performance at all. It ran on the cooler side due to the lower specs with lower power limits. The fan noise is on the quieter side, even under worst case load, but I'm not sure how the screen pad will go long term with the hot CPU and GPU below. I presume ASUS have considered this and put something between them to protect it. Next, let's take a look at gaming. Although the ZenBook Duo only has Nvidia MX250 graphics, it should still be capable of playing some lightweight titles, so let's see what it can do. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and it was only really running well with the low setting preset. At any other setting level, the frame rate seemed to drop quite substantially. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane, and at maximum settings, it was still playing okay with above 60 FPS averages. However, medium settings and below was much better, where even the 1% low was higher than this. Overwatch was tested in the practice range with a 100% render scale. Medium settings was needed to average above 60 FPS and it was playable, but higher settings weren't running too well. CSGO was tested with the Uletical FPS benchmark tool, and medium settings was able to score above 100 FPS in this test. However, the 1% lows were quite weak. You can still play esports titles pretty well even at 1080p. 
However, lower settings are needed as we just saw. For more demanding games, you'll either want lower resolutions, or ideally a laptop with more powerful graphics if gaming is a priority. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the 512GB NVMe SSD, and it's performing okay. But according to the ASUS spec sheet, it's only using two PCIe lanes. The one terabyte option is apparently four lane though. Unfortunately, I can't test the micro SD card slot as I don't have any cards that size. For updated pricing, check the links in the description as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, I can't really see it for sale in the US, so it may not be available quite yet. Here in Australia with the specs I've got, it's available for 1700 Australian dollars, which with taxes removed and converted is about 1030 US dollars. Alternatively, we can get double the memory, double the storage space, and i7 CPU for 600 Australian dollars more, or about 365 US dollars extra. For comparison, the ZenBook Pro Duo is substantially more expensive. However, it does have more powerful specs, OLED screen, and the option of upgrading further to the i9 version. It's just a way more premium option. You can check my review linked in the description for more information on that one. With all of that in mind, let's conclude by going through the good and bad aspects of the ASUS ZenBook Duo laptop. Basically, it's a cheaper alternative to the more expensive and feature-rich ZenBook Pro Duo. It still offers the key feature of the Duo series, being the two screens. However, the non-Pro version we're covering here has fewer features with weaker specs, which is why it's cheaper. With that in mind though, it's still one of the few laptops available with a somewhat large secondary screen built in. So if that's going to be useful to you and you aren't made of money, then it's definitely worth considering. Overall, I found the second screen beneficial, and the screen expert software helped in managing it. It will depend on how you plan on using the screen. For instance, getting games to make use of it will vary wildly based on the specific game. But for simply being able to watch a video or have a browser window in view that you couldn't before, it's a nice addition. The content creator side of it was also interesting, but again, it will depend on the application. When it comes down to it, it's just a physically separate screen below the main one, so you can use your imagination as to how that might benefit your individual workflow. An external screen may be more beneficial as it can be larger, but that's an extra piece of hardware to carry around with you. Despite the secondary screen, we've still got a fairly small and lightweight 14 inch laptop here. The main trade off with the unique design is the forward placement of the keyboard and the requirement for an off to the side narrow touchpad. However, if you have desk space to push the machine back, typing was still fine. And you can always use a mouse. The additional screen does affect battery life, but you've got the option of disabling it if not in use. But either way, the battery life was quite good. As the specs are on the lower side, thermals weren't an issue. It ran quiet even under heavy load and didn't feel too warm to the touch in the areas where you'll actually be placing your hands. The MX250 graphics is a nice step up over the Intel integrated graphics. However, in terms of gaming, it's still only able to handle lightweight esports titles at lower settings at 1080p. It's not really a gaming laptop, but light gaming was possible, and the graphics would be beneficial for GPU acceleration in some content creation workloads like video editing. There's not much room in the way of upgradability. All you could do is swap out the M.2 drive, but that would require either cloning the drive or installing Windows Fresh, as there's only room for one slot. The memory, CPU, and GPU can't be upgraded, so you'll have to try and buy with the future in mind. I thought there was a fair selection of I.O., but I think Thunderbolt on a machine like this would have been great to see. For the price, I think the ZenBook Duo is an interesting laptop. It's offering a second screen at a cheaper price point compared to the Pro Duo model while still maintaining a good build quality. And there's just not much else to compare it to at the moment, it's quite unique. If you think you may benefit from more screen real estate and don't want to pay more for the higher spec Pro model, then it's definitely worth considering. Let me know what you thought about the ASUS ZenBook Duo laptop down in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, consider getting subscribed for future laptop reviews and tech videos like this one.